Okay. Believe me, I'm as excited to, to be lecturing on the 27th as you guys are to be here. So I have to have a chat with Elaine and say, you know what, maybe the you know, day after Christmas vacation we should probably not do a lecture. But in any event, let's go to Copenhagen. And so the best way to see it is, is by a tourist boat because the um, canals run everywhere. And so you get a nice kind of an overview of the city. And this is one of the old fortresses at the entrance to the um, harbor that used to protect the city. And then they're very much into clean energy in Europe. So this is something that like burns trash or something or they're very, very clean energy. This is the mermaid. And I don't know if you guys have heard the famous mermaid statue. This is the famous mermaid statue in Copenhagen and all the tourists sitting around taking pictures of it. Of course, as we were there in the boat, you see the sun is coming right into our eyes. And so that's as close, this is right from the boat. So this is as close as we came to the little mermaid statue. So this was based on Hans Christian Andersen's, you know, little mermaid. So or because you're younger, or Disney, Little Mermaid, you know? Okay. Yeah. Although they didn't have Disney when they made this statue, but still. So this is the famous mermaid. Okay, cornea. So, Becca, yeah. cornea, anatomy, starting from the outside and working to the inside. What's the outermost layer? Epithelium. Epithelium. And under that? Bones. Bones layer. And then beneath that? Stroma. Stroma. Decimage and endothelium. All right, so let's go ahead and let's start a couple layers at a time. So, uh, Shrav, tell me a little bit about the, end, the epithelium. Okay. How many layers thick is it usually? Five to seven. Five to seven, very good. And I want you to note, here's the epithelium. Here's Bowman's layer. Okay, Nico, what is Bowman's layer? Um, Bowman's layer is not a true basement membrane, um, and it's a cellular. And if you were to injure Bowman's layer, does it regrow? It does not. It does not. So, key to remember, Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane. We call it Bowman's membrane. It's not really a membrane. It's a layer. So, it's condensed acellular stroma and it does not regenerate. So if you damage Bowman's, then Bowman's does not regenerate. And Tara, what kind of stain are we using right here and why would I be showing you this? Um, is this like the ones that are in red? Oh, it does kind of stain red. The red part. Now look closer at the epithelium. It's a PAS, and what does PAS really light up? Basement membrane. Basement membrane. So note, here is the basement membrane of the epithelium right here. Here is Bowman's underneath it. So the basement membrane of the epithelium picks up PAS stain. Bowman's is not the basement membrane. That's important. People always get that confused. And so Bowman's layer does not pick up PAS stain, and the basement membrane of the epithelium does, so it's above Bowman's. All right, what layer are we looking at right here, Reese? Uh, endothelium and decimase. Okay. Tell me about PAS staining and decimase. It will stain. It will stain. So decimase is indeed a basement membrane, and in fact, if you were to look at decimase with electron microscopy, decimase is really two layers. There's an anterior banded layer, and that's thought to be the congenital, banded meaning bands of collagen. You have to do EM to CM. And they're very regular, and that's the, almost the congenital decimase membrane. But remember, because decimase is the basement membrane of the endothelium, it is continually laid down throughout life. So that posterior non banded layer gets thicker throughout life because the endothelial cells are laying it down. So decimase does indeed regenerate. So you get a break in decimase, 
the endothelial cells can slide over and fill it in and lay out new decimates. Now, let me see if I've got one more. I do. Okay. So back to Becca. In terms of the endothelium, tell me what are the functions of the corneal endothelium? Okay, so they keep it detergest. They keep the fluid from, from going into the cornea because when the endothelium breaks down, the cornea becomes edematous. Fluid pours in there. And what are a couple of different ways the endothelium can do that? Okay, so because I am, I am Greek, especially males. Greek males are known to not talk quietly and to project. And so when you are talking quietly and not quite sure what you're saying, you're not projecting an air of confidence that you know the answer. So if you don't know it, you say, I don't know. If you're taking a guess, say it with conviction, you know. That, you know. So a couple of ways the endothelium keeps the cornea detergest, it's got tight junctions. So the endothelium has very much tight junctions between the cells. And if you look at it in three dimensions, it's a geodesic dome. It's actually hexagonal. Now, if you look at it in a cross-section, they look cuboidal. But in three dimensions, they're hexagonal, which is kind of nature's way of covering a curved space with a single layer. So just like geodesic domes are, are hexagonal, and the corneal endothelium is the same way. It's got tight junctions. But it also has a pumping mechanism. So it'll also actively pump fluid out, but nutrients into the cornea, so it, it pumps both ways. Now, can endothelium regenerate? I guess I have to be specific. In a primate? I don't know. Yeah. See, that's fine. You always say, I don't know. That's better than saying, ah. So it does not effectively regenerate. Now, some people have argued, well, they maybe we'll have a few endothelial cells grow, but they don't. Now, a rabbit, you know, if you guys are practicing cataract surgery in a rabbit now, you know, Reese could take out 10,000 easily, 10,000 endothelial cells with his phaco tip. But um, rabbits regenerate them. Primates do not. And so when you're in humans doing cataract surgery and you knock out 10,000 endothelial cells with your phaco tip, they don't effectively regenerate it. One of the issues now is to get them to regenerate and, and there's a lab, Dr. Kinoshira in Japan is really trying to regenerate endothelial cells, which would be great, because then you wouldn't have to do corneal transplants or desects or surgeries like that. All right, so we're going to look at some diseases here that affect the cornea. Shrav, what are we seeing right here? pattern, you said it's actually kind of between where the palpebral fissure is, between where the lids sit. So you've got this, this dark area right here. What do you think that could be? Iron? That's one thought, although iron usually doesn't get that diffuse. What else can be deposited in a cornea? Calcium. Calcium, exactly. And this is one of those descriptive terms. You see it forms that broad area, that band. So thus the name band keratopathy. And so it is indeed a deposition of calcium. It starts at the limbus between the eyelids and the palpebral fissure and eventually will march all the way across the cornea. Now, band keratopathy is pretty nonspecific. It's just a sign of inflammation in general. And so you can have it from external inflammation, you can have it from internal inflammation, but you get deposition of calcium. And here is a uh, close-up of a cornea with band keratopathy. Now, Extra bonus points, what are these kind of blank spaces in the middle here where the calcium is not being taken up? And I'm not sure is a legitimate answer. That's okay. I'm not sure, but it could be, I mean, it could be maybe a loss of a layer of the Well, believe it or not, these are where the little nerves penetrate through. And so when the nerves to the epithelium, they penetrate Bowman's layer, and where they do, 
it leaves a little circle there in the calcium. So that's where the nerves penetrate. Now, if you ever had a corneal abrasion, if you have, you know that that cornea is exquisitely innervated because it really hurts. And so these are just the nerves poking through the calcium. So when we look at the pathology, I'm sorry, I should flip this around, it's sideways, but here's the epithelium, here's a bunch of connective tissue, here is Bowman's layer, and what stain is this? Well, this stains the calcium red. So this is alizarin red, and it stains calcium. And so you see the calcium is predominantly along Bowman's layer, and that's where you've got the calcium. Now, Nico, what's going on right here? call that if it's growing from the limbus between Bowman's and epithelium? Uh, that's called the panis. It's a panis. And so panis can often run along with band care top. And if you look right here, here's the epithelium, here's Bowman's with calcium, and here's connective tissue. And so panis is one of those things that, again, is kind of a nonspecific sign of a chronic inflammation. And so panis and Band care top, they often run together. They're homies, they, they, they hang together. So if you look right here, you can see panaces can be vascularized, but also panaces can be fibrous. And here again, here's a fibrous panace. This is calcium along Bowman's and calcium here. So panace and band care top, they often run together. Tara, what are we seeing right here? kind of a weird picture with some heterochromia, but I was trying to show the arcus here. They used to call it arcus senilis. Senilis is a bad word now, because you know we're not allowed to say senilis, it's bad. So maybe President Trump will allow us to say senilis now, because you know, he's gonna take away political correctness. He's gonna say it like it is, he can say senilis. But if you look right here, it's interesting when you see this arc of this shadowing around the periphery, note the clear zone. And so whenever you see a clear zone, and then the limbus here in a clear zone, it usually means that this is kind of a diffusion gradient of some kind, or people have speculated that this may be diffusion. And what is the material in Arcus senilis? Nope. I'm not sure. It's actually lipid. So it's a lipid deposition. And so if this is indeed lipid, and I'm showing you this slide, what stain would this be? Oil red O. Oil red O. So this is an easy one to remember because it stains those little O's red and they've got oil in them. So oil red O. What do we have to do to the tissue in order to get this stain to work? It has to be fresh. It has to be fresh because if we process it through, the oil gets dissolved. And so this is a stain on actually a fresh cornea, and I had to copy this from Dave Apple. I mean, you know, we don't get fresh cornea sent to us. And so this is an arcosinillus, and you see that the deposition of lipid is more anterior and more posterior, and people say it's shaped like an hourglass. You know how an hourglass comes into the middle and then goes out above and below, so it's shaped like an hourglass here and then here. So the lipid is more posterior and anterior. And again, it diffuses in a little bit from the limbus. And we see this, you know, at the VA, you know, everybody's got a pinguecula, dry eye, and an arcus. And so you see this very, very commonly. It doesn't really portend disease, nor necessarily mean that they've got high cholesterol or high lipid. 
All right, Reese, what are we seeing here? Uh, that looks like a dead dry. Okay, so what do you think is causing this? Uh, we're worried about herpes virus. Okay, so this is what I call a classic dendrite. You see the little bulb-shaped outpouchings, and then it stains in the middle, and you've got the little bulb shape. So this is classic herpes, what kind? Simplex. Simplex. Now, zoster dendrites aren't quite this classic. You can also get dendrites in, in zoster, but herpes is most common. So you guys are going to learn something today that's going to help you for the rest of your career. If ever an attending shows you a picture of the cornea and says, what is the differential diagnosis? You say offhanded, well, of course, herpes. And you say that offhanded, well, of course, herpes. And then they say, well, which one? You say, well, most likely simplex, but could be zoster. So remember that. No matter what, they show you. Because herpes is in the differential diagnosis of everything. And so you say it offhand, well, of course, herpes. Well, you're thinking of what the real differential diagnosis is. And so that, that'll help you get through boards. So when you look at a cornea here, you can see that what's happened to the epithelium here? It's lost. Yeah, it's gone. And so remember, what does fluorescein stain? Uh, the area. Exactly. So that area that's the bright green staining is where the epithelium is denuded. And so if you were going to try to do a culture you don't want to scrape right in the middle here because the epithelium is not in there. There's no active viruses there. You want to scrape at the edges here where the active virus is. And so the fluorescein dye is taken up where the epithelium has been denuded or broken up. And so you can see that. And then you see there is a chronic kind of mononuclear inflammatory reaction, mostly um, lymphocytes. But you can also get a deeper herpes, what we call a stromal herpes, or you know, deeper herpes, and what this is characterized by is you get inflammation way down deep near decimates membrane, and sometimes you can even see giant cells along decimates membrane really deep, and so these are more difficult. The epithelial herpes are easier to treat. You treat topical antivirals, you can even just scrape them and denude them, and, and that will help. But once the herpes gets into the stroma, then you start to get the chronic herpes and the recurrent herpes. When you guys do your cornea lectures, you're going to know all about prophylaxis and ways to keep them from coming back and things. But remember, when you get these deeper herpes, you can even get giant cells down here by decimase membrane. And this is trying to show you inclusions, because this is a scraping, so I apologize. It's not a very good picture, but you can see that there are inclusions here in the nucleus of the cells. And so herpes and a lot of viruses will give you little intranuclear inclusions. Now, we don't even have to worry about that because now we've got PCR and other ways of diagnosing this. And so it's a lot easier to diagnose than it used to be in the olden days when I was a resident. All right, Becca, what are we seeing here? concerned about here in the cornea? Exactly, so bacterial ulcer. So this guy was actually a contact lens wearer. And as you can see by his fingers as he was holding his lid up, not very hygienic. And so this was a corneal ulcer. And it turned out this was a pseudomonas. And for some reason, pseudomonas loves living in contact lens cases. You know, they're wet, they're moist, they're warm. And so all it, and, and all it takes is you just overwear your contact a little bit just to give some microtrauma to the epithelium. And as a result, then the bacteria can start taking hold. And so you get a corneal ulcer. And corneal ulcers are truly an ophthalmic emergency because if you don't treat them properly and soon, what can happen? Exactly. So here's the cornea. Look, the epithelium is almost gone. Remember we showed you that nice pink stroma? Well, the stroma here is all white because it's necrotic, and sure enough, there's a perforation. 
So it's a double, it, it's a double whammy because the bacteria themselves will often elute proteases and collagenases to melt the tissue, but then what do the PMNs that come in to fight them elute? They elute all kinds of materials in their granules that can melt corneas. And so you have to stop the ulceration immediately. And so these are people, when you get them, you scrape them to culture and then you start, you get a bottle of, of something right away and you start putting them in every five minutes and every 15 minutes. And these guys have to be on antibiotics hourly. I mean, they literally have to set their alarm and get up hourly because if you don't kill those bacteria, not only will they melt the cornea, but then these PMNs will come in here and they will dump all of their granules in there. And here's all the PMNs here. And they will dump all of their granules in there and they can melt the cornea in, in 24 to 48 hours. And so bacterial corneal ulcers are truly an emergency, especially if it's an aggressive bacteria like a pseudomonas. All right, Shrug, what are we seeing here? here and you see here's this lesion and then look at this halo of kind of haze around it here. So this here is an Idaho farmer, he's a potato farmer. And you say, do you have, you know, did you, you know, remember getting anything in? Oh, I don't know. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe something got in my eye, Doc. I bet it's been hurting me lately, you know. How long's it been hurting you? Oh, I don't know. Week. And then the wife goes, no, no, it's even longer than that, you know, because the wife always tells the truth, because Idaho farmers, they're like, oh no, it's that's fine, I got this thing in my eye, you know, and he's like hand motion vision with, with this. What do you think this could be? Yeah, and so this is a little bit more indolent than the bacterial ulcer. So this is more a fungal ulcer. And the key with fungal ulcers is there's some vegetative exposure. And so people will say, oh yeah, I was trimming my bushes last week or I was out digging up potatoes, who knows? But they'll have some kind of exposure and it's more indolent. It doesn't happen overnight, but slowly over the course of a couple of weeks, you'll get this, you'll get this lesion. And then when you look, you can see here are the little fungi, what I call the yeasty beasties. So what kind of stain do we do for fungi? GMS. GMS. So Gamori methenamine silver. And the reason I say that is here's the silver. And so the actual fungi will stain this silvery black color. So GMS stain will stain for fungi. Now, you can sometimes see these even on H&E or PAS, but the GMS will specifically stain them. And then this is treated differently than bacterial ulcers. You've got to use the antifungals, which can be pretty nasty, by the way, to the surface of the eye. And so this, these are pretty tough to treat. Okay, Nico, what are we seeing here? So this is an external photograph. Um, so the cornea looks uh, very hazy, there seems to be like a triangular um, off-center, maybe epi defect. Okay, um, so big epi defect here. And then a little beneath it is a whitish ring fil infiltrate. And this ring. Like hazy borders. So what do you think this could be? This could be a catamiva. Exactly. And, and the history with these is, again, kind of indolent. These are often misdiagnosed as a herpes. So they'll be treated with herpes for a while, then they don't get better and they hurt. So people will just say, God, this thing hurts. And you look, there's this chronic non-healing epithelial ulcer and there's this ring infiltrate. And so when we do a special stain, wow, bonus points. I don't think I showed you this. What's the stain we do for acanth amoeba? Gridley stain. Gridley stain, exactly. So the Gridley stain is a stain that stains the acanth amoeba cysts. And again, it stains them kind of a silvery, almost like the um, yeast are stained. And so it'll stain the stroma green, but here's the acanthamoebas, here's the cysts, here's the trophozoites. And acanthamoebas are very difficult to treat because if you do an EM, they are a triple line cyst. So they've got this hard wall around it and getting medicine into that cyst is very difficult to do. And so, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, we were talking grand rounds a couple weeks ago. You know, Boopy was mentioning how they had to get medicine from England. You know, we used to treat these with uh, propamidine. It's called broline. You had to order it from England. But now, uh, what works pretty well is actually swimming pool disinfectant. 
And so we literally put swimming pool disinfectant in the eyes. And you can imagine how good that feels. And so you can do that. Even Neosporin will sometimes work a little bit. But these are tough because when they insist, you can't treat them. And if they start going into the nerves, they like to go perineural. That's why they hurt. And they get out of the cornea into the sclera. These are very difficult. As Boopy would say, they're real buggers, bugbears, you know, bugbears to treat. So very difficult to treat. So the key with they get the amoeba is you want to be very suspicious early. And so you can get these from contact lens cases. You get them from hot tubs. You know, so if you're ever in a hot tub, don't put your face in it, you know. You can sit in up to your neck and enjoy it, but then the bubbles and all, but don't put your face in it because you can get them. They love warm, moist environments. So obviously there's not a lot of acanth amoeba outside now, but, but, you know, if you're in a hot tub up at Deer Valley or something, you know, be wary. Don't put your face in it. All right, what do we see in here, Tara? You know, it's always hard to see when they put the slip beam on there because you can't see depth, and that's what's hard when they do boards too. You look at this and you say, man, is that epithelium? Is it endothelium? Who knows where that is? But I'll give you a hint. It's, it's more superficial, just under the epithelium. So what are you starting to think about here? Yeah, so you start to think of some of the different dystrophies, is, is a better word. And so we're going to spend quite a bit of time here on dystrophies. And so some of the anterior dystrophies, um, you know, map dot fingerprint is one of them, what we call epithelial basement membrane dystrophies. And, you know, it's got a good name. You see the little mapping that's going on there. And then this one I, we're trying to show with the slit lamp here, the fingerprints. And you see here's kind of the fingerprint lines. And then against retroillumination, you can see that there's some dots, there's some fingerprints, there's edges of maps, but they're very superficial. They're right under the epithelium. Now, this is, I wanted to take, I took this out of a textbook. This is a pretty bad picture because it's blurry, but you can see that there's multiple areas here of this thickened epithelial basement membrane on PAS stain. But this is a good one. We just had this in the lab two weeks ago. This was a superficial scraping to try to do this. And this is epithelium that's been scraped off. And look at the basement membrane. I mean, that's almost as thick as the epithelium. And so that is a classic sign of map dot fingerprint dystrophy. It is a dystrophy of the epithelial basement membrane. And so sometimes in order to treat it, you have to just scrape the epithelium off. Now, what's the problem with this dystrophy? What does it cause in terms of patient symptoms and findings? Exactly. So because the epithelium doesn't stick down properly to Bowman's layer, you get recurrent erosions. Those people have recurrent erosions. Sometimes you have to scrape it off and hope it comes back fine. Um, you can use a, a laser. You can use an, an eczema laser to re-kind of marbleize the surface of the cornea. And what we used to have to do before we had that is do micropuncture. And so you can literally take a 25-gauge needle and bend it, almost like a cystotome, and you do micropuncture and that helps to anchor down the epithelium, kind of scar it down into Bowman's layer so you don't get the recurrent erosions. So that's epithelial basement membranes, map dot fingerprint. And there's a close-up. Look at the thickness of that epithelial basement membrane. I mean, that's massive. Reese, what do we see in here? Um, just lots of little dots scattered. Yeah, so again, hard to see with the beam, really difficult, but they're more superficial, uh, and they're forming little dis discrete dots. What, what dystrophy gives you these discrete dots? Would it be massive, granular, massive? How about more superficial? We're not um, yet in the stroma. We're still in kind of Bowman's subepithelial. Starts with an M. Miesmans. Okay, now, I just got to tell you, there are a thousand corneal dystrophies. When you guys do cornea, you'll read them this. Every, you know, so they find some village in Italy, and they find a dystrophy. Okay, so they name it after the village. I mean, there's corneal dystrophies everywhere. So we're trying to just cover the common ones. The reason I wanted to cover this one, Miesmans, is because the path is really cool. And so you get this PAS-positive-like stuff 
under the epithelium, between epithelium and bones, and they form these little discrete dots here. And it's interesting, some clever pathologists call this peculiar substance. That's the name of this stuff. It's really called peculiar substance. And so I just thought that sounded cool. So do that. But that, that shows you distinct dots. It's a little bit different than mapped out fingerprint. It's these more distinct dots, and it's Miesemann's dystrophy. Now, there's another superficial dystrophy that you guys may hear about. Becca, I won't make you do this because, you know, I don't even understand it anyway. But, but this is this is Reese's dystrophy. It's Reese Buchler. And there's a type 1, there's a type 2, there's all kinds of types. But in any event, you get this kind of a honeycomb pattern. But again, it's superficial. It's under the epithelium. When you do the path, you'll actually see areas where Bowman's is just completely gone. So we kind of start with dystrophies of the epithelium, subepithelium, Bowman's layer, and then we go deeper. And so now we have the stromal dystrophy. So for the interns, there is a mnemonic that you have to remember. So get your pens out and write this down. And so the mnemonic is, and the easiest way to write it down is write it from top to bottom because then you can fill in next to it what it is. So the first line on the top is Maryland. Second line is Monroe. Third one is Really. Always. Gets. Her. Man. L. A. California. Or LA County. You can do either one. So let's see. So, Maryland. M. That's the first corneostromal dystrophy. So what, what is this one called? Okay, that's all right. That's all right. So this is macular. So macular, these are corneostromal dystrophies. So if you look at macular, you can see that there are these opacities. But if you look carefully, you'll see that even in between the opacities, it is hazy. And so it's very hazy even in between. So macular, Marilyn Monroe, mucopolysaccharide. So it's, it's a deposition of mucopolysaccharide. Always a alcyon blue. Marilyn Monroe, I'm sorry, really always. So really, R, recessive. I even have to think about this. I don't know who made this up, but this has been around since the ancient times, you know, since even the 80s. So it's recessive. You know, that's all you have to memorize because the rest are all dominant. So macular mucopolysaccharide recessive, always alcyon blue. So alcyon blue is the stain. So this tells you the dystrophy, the material, and the stain. So that's why this mnemonic is nice. So alcyon blue, Mucopolysaccharide. And there's a, oh man, that's a fellow's picture. I'm going to have to take that out. It's blurry. Okay. Gets. Granular. granular. And the difference between granular and macular is if you look, you see these individual granules. It's well named. Now here's macular up here. Here's granular down here. Look, it's like cookie crumbs. But notice the clear spaces in between. So it's like there's little crumbs, little breadcrumbs in there, but there's clear spaces in between. And here you see on a retroillumination, the granular, her, H. What does that stand for? It's hyland. And so hyland, man, Masson's trichrome. So Masson's trichrome, Stains for the hyaline. Nico, what are we seeing here? Uh, this is a lattice degeneration. Lattice, and you see the name. It looks like a irregular lattice work. So think of a 
you know, lattice work that, that you know, you have rose bushes grow on that, you know, it's gotten old and the nails have fallen out and it's gotten all crooked. And so you see all these little lattice lines. So L, A, amyloid, amyloid. California or county? Uh, that's Congo red. Congo red. So the stain for amyloid is Congo red. Now, again, I, I don't like that. You, know, you guys, is that red to you? It's kind of more, I don't know, red-orange to me. So I never really bought red, but it's kind of red-orange. And so this is a Congo red stain. And the cool thing about Congo red is if you put two polarized filters on and cross them, you get birefringence. And so here you can see we've actually cross-polarized them. And where the Congo red is, it lights up and so birefringence. So, Macular, mucopolysaccharide, recessive, ocean blue, hyaline, I'm sorry, granular, hyaline, Assange trichrome, lattice, amyloid, Congo red. So if you know that mnemonic, you know the cornea stromal dystrophy. And this just shows you that not all amyloid is in the um, lattice distribution. So this is actually amyloid of the cornea. So pretty nasty deposition there. And when you look at it again, this is now cross polarization. So that is not yellow, that, that is the red stain lighting up when you cross polarize. So you can actually get amyloid deposition without lattice, both primary and secondary. You know, systemic amyloid and local amyloid to the eye. All right, what do we see in here, Tara? Um, so it looks like that's just some type of maybe like a stromal dystrophy with a lot of kind of like fine deposits. You know, if you look real carefully when the light hits, look at that irregularity. People call this a beaten metal look. It looks like someone took a part of the eye and just hammered it with a round hammer. So what dystrophy gives you this kind of beaten metal look? Exactly. So now we've moved through the stroma. Now we're posteriorly. And there's a bunch of decimase and predecimase dystrophies. And again, I don't have time to, to do them. You, you guys can decide whether you want to memorize all those or not. Um, but kind of skipping over them a little bit, if you look at you know, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, then uh, Fuchs dystrophy is more, people will call it a decimase or an endothelial dystrophy. And when you look at these, you've got this little, you know, as I said, it looks like a beaten metal appearance, but it's deep. When you put the slip lamp in a true Fuchs, you'll actually be able to see that it's very deep. And here's retroillumination, and you've got all these little dots. It looks like someone just pounded a sheet metal with that. So, you know, in the olden days, boys took shock in seventh grade, and girls took home ec, great, huh? And so as part of the shop, you had to work with metal, and so we had a really sadistic shop instructor, and so guys, to get back at him, would like take the sheet metal and just hammer the hell out of it, just to be passive aggressive as 13-year-old boys can be, and so it looks like this, and so you just, looks like you took a ball-peen hammer and just hammered a little piece of sheet metal. So, you know, girls did important things, like learn to bake cakes and, you know, make doilies and things, and so, you know, Thank goodness you guys are in a different era, you know? Get it take home? Oh, good. So, please, you know, and, and I remember there was one guy who wanted to take home back, and man, he, that poor guy, talk about being ostracized. I mean, he, he really took it. So, we didn't have any girls who wanted to take shop. And, you know, nowadays, I don't think they do it that way. So yeah, we're also kind of split. Like, you guys do a little bit of both. Yeah, well, good. That's how it should be. It should be, because guys should know how to cook and stuff like that, too, or we'd starve to death. So. So what does it look like? What is this path? There is. Um, sorry, so there's, there's a loss of endothelial okay. cells. Okay, endothelial cells are almost all gone here. And then there's thickening of um, decimase. Exactly. So look at decimase right here. Now, this is the most, you know, you know, blatant example I could find when you take a picture of this. If you look at decimase membrane, that's probably four times normal thickness. So markedly thickened decimase membrane, what do we call these little deposits? Uh, 
guttata. So you get these little guttata, and that's what you see on the slip that gives you the bulky hammer. So these are guttata. They're little deposits, and unfortunately, the endothelial cells in between die off. And so eventually, you get enough endothelial cells die off, they get corneal edema. So these guttata, they're these little flat-topped, butte-shaped little deposits here. And then you see the endothelial cells will be in between, and they eventually will die off, and you'll get corneal edema. So Fuchs dystrophy is the most common you know, endothelial dystrophy, posterior dystrophy. Reese, what are we seeing here? Um, sorry. Munson's sign. Munson's sign. And what is this showing? Keratoconus. Keratoconus. Look at this kid. We've got him looking down. I mean, look at the indentation on the lid there. I mean, his corneas are cone shaped. Now, this is end stage. I mean, you hopefully won't see this nowadays because we have superficial topography where you can see the problem with the steepening and the inferior central cornea, but this is a severe example. It's called Munson's sign of keratoconus. And what's the pathology usually that we see? Uh, it's, it breaks and bowman's epithelial remodeling. Exactly. So you see this little discontinuity or break in bowman's there. So some people have argued that this is actually bowman's dystrophy. I don't know. We're still looking at that. But the idea is, is that you get focal discontinuities or breaks in bowman's layer. You get progressive thinning of the stroma, especially inferior centrally, where it starts to outpouch like a cone. And what do you think happened to this guy? This is a long history of keratoconus. Uh, maybe hydrops. So what is hydrops? Uh, where you get a break in decimase and the corneas gets emasculated. Exactly. So if you think about it, you know, think about, you know, decimase is pretty elastic. That cone is pooching out, pooching out, pooching out, and finally, Decimase just breaks, and so fluid gushes into the stroma, and you get this acute corneal edema. Now, you don't have to urgently do a cornea transplant, and if you sit on it, eventually this can actually heal up. And here you see a cornea with high drops. There's decimase, and you see where it broke. And decimase is elastic, so it curls in. But if you can just get the patient through this, the endothelium will eventually slide over. It doesn't my toast, but it'll slide and the cells will get bigger, and it'll eventually bridge that gap and start laying down new, de new decimase membrane, and you can actually get the cornea beginning to detergest. But it does cause a scar there, so you want to try to treat this before you get to the point where you end up having um, the high drops. And so, you know, now finally in the U.S., we've got approval for cross-linking, and I think cross-linking is going to be what you guys are going to be using to treat decimase membrane, and earlier the better. And so eventually, I think we're going to be treating true keratoconus in teenagers with cross-linking. Yeah? So the endothelium are really attached to that decimase? Yes. So there's cells there that are kind of... They're right here. These are actually endothelial cells right there, those little tiny dark, dark dots. How do they come back and regenerate? They don't regenerate. They get bigger. So when you traumatize endothelium, it loosens its grip on, on decimase and it slides over and fills the gap with whatever you do to injure the endothelium. And then the cells get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so when you do an endothelial cell count, you know, you're counting the cells in a little centimeter of space, you know, the cell count's going to go way down because the cells are getting bigger and bigger to slide over and fill that gap because there's only so many to do that. So eventually your endothelial count's going to go low enough that it's not going to be able to keep, keep that cornea clear. There's a close-up. Here's elastic decimase curled up. I said, look, those are endothelial cells. They're still intact in this dystrophy, in this keratoconus, if you want to call it a dystrophy. All right, now back to Becca. So one of the things we wanted to do is we want to talk a little bit about you know, other things that can affect the cornea. And you can also get deposition of another material beside calcium that commonly occurs in the cornea. Iron. And what's the stain we do for iron? So this is an easy one to remember because, well, easy if after I, you know, pound my history into your head. Prussian blue. Okay, so who are the Prussians? Prussians were the militarists when Germany first reunited in 1870 that really drove World War I. And so 
Prussian, you think of Prussians, what do you think of? Iron, tanks, guns, you know, cannons, iron. And so Prussian blue stains iron. And so this is iron deposition in the basilar layer of the epithelium. And it's interesting, there's all kinds of iron lines. And the bottom line is whenever you get something, either a divot or a raised area that allows tears to pool, iron can deposit there. So you can have an iron line at the base of a keratoconus, you have the iron line at the head of a pterygium, you can even have an iron line right where your lid sits. You get a little tiny you know, pooling of tears, you get an iron line. So you have to memorize all of these different iron lines. But the bottom line is when you do a Prussian blue stain for iron, you see that it's in the base of the layer of the epithelium iron. Okay, so I'm trying. This is a corneal button. It's been cut in half. What kind of surgery has this cornea had before? Yeah, you see the stitches that are there. And obviously this is a resident case because they're all irregular. They're not regular there. So it's maybe the cornea fellow's first case. Now, what do you make of that cornea? It's really Yeah, it's thick, it's white, it's edematous. In fact, the epithelium here is kind of sloughed off. And so we look at it right here. First of all, what kind of stain is this and what am I showing you? Look closer. Ah, PAS. So what is this right here? Yeah, so when you get edema, the edema doesn't slide under the basal membrane of the epithelium because that epithelium is tightly adherent to Bowman's layer. In fact, it sends little tonal filaments, little anchors that anchor that in there. And so what happens is this fluid percolates through the cornea and it goes into the basilar cells and it makes them swell and then eventually they pop. And you see the basal membrane stays down here and so those cells pop. So what do we call this condition? Bolus keratopathy. So bola is a blister and so it forms a blister. So bolus keratopathy and that's a sign of edema. So again, it's not under the epithelial basal membrane. It actually percolates through it and then it's above it. So the basal membrane stays down here on on Bowman's layer. So this is bolus keratopathy, and that is kind of an end stage for anything that affects the endothelium. So if you look at a cornea button that has failed after PKP, bolus keratopathy is kind of the end result. And so it can be due to damage to the endothelium, it can be due to high pressure, it can be due to all kinds of reasons, but bolus keratopathy is when you get end stage corneal edema. All right, and this is the Royal Yacht you know, in the harbor here in Copenhagen. Nice, beautiful, old, you know, 100-year-old ship. And evidently, you can tour that, but we didn't have time to do that. So, next week is, I think, is it glaucoma or is it a lens? In the lens. 